I have a feeling they're all going to be celebrating, thinking they've won this battle. And then In is going to swoop the prince. Ragnarok. Did he? Did he really? I don't think so. I think it means too much to him. It's already been established. What in the world was that? I thought it was a machine, but nope, it's just Oracle. <laughs> I haven't seen pitching this good since Zeke. Oracle is a baseball fan, confirmed. He's even on a wall. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? He can literally throw balls across the ocean. Speaking of balls. Ragnar, stop mothering your subject and get out here. <laughs> I mean, you would think, but you never know. Thorkel is just an army unto himself, I guess. This is very familiar, this whole setup. This whole barrage. It's a very interesting passage to be listening to right before picking up the sword. He's got a lot to prove. It's a big hill to climb. I don't think he wants to retreat. I don't think he has the same interest as Ragnar. Ragnar's highest priority seems to be the prince's life. I don't think that's the prince's highest priority. Without even a word of dialogue so far, it already feels like his back is up against the wall and he has nothing to lose. And it's only up from here. And that is enough to make someone dangerous. No one expects him to win, it seems. I'm curious about the significance of that passage as well. I feel like I'm gonna be keeping that in mind for a while. It might be foreshadowing of his ultimate demise by the sword. Although that it wouldn't be surprising for anyone in the show. <laughs> Pretty safe prediction for a lot of them. I don't know what God can do against Thorkel. What exactly does that mean to Thorkel? I mean, he could probably end this whole arc right here. He just throws a rock at the tent, packs it up, calls it a day, you know? It's really cool to me how they've set up Newt already to be an awesome character. Hasn't said one word yet. Just exists in a state of silent contemplation. The people around him having discussions about him and sort of jeering at him, creating a vessel that his character can take shape in already. And I'm sort of rooting for him, which is weird to say. It's his to lose, you know? His to lose and to win. Another field dream? Field vision? Family, just like Thor's. And my jacked livestock is there too, sort of. Dude, this whole character roster just kind of dropped off the map, like off screen too. We never really saw the aftermath of Thor's death, except for what happened to Thorfinn. There he is, the man himself, the legend. What's Leaf up to, I wonder? Probably sailing and alcohol. The vision of what could have been, I guess. It's interesting this is happening now. I mean, this is all him, right? This is all in, inside of him. It's all things he knows, maybe things he's been burying. He still hears his father's voice all these years later. It's still there. And that is also there a lot. Watch it be his group and him himself pillaging. <laughs> so it's just a dream. It's there. You can't deny it forever. I mean, I feel like with things like this, because of his age and the fact that there's just no way he could have processed that in any meaningful measure, it's just going to sort of wait for his intellect and, and other faculties to catch up to a point where they can process them. But that's going to be really difficult because he's built up so much around not dealing with those things, not looking at those things. What he is doing now, the way he's found survival and safety and any kind of regard at all, if you can call it that, as weird as it is to call it that, is by the very act of ignoring these things that are welling up inside of him. In the dream, it's still an invading force that killed his father. Feels like he's still not making that connection. It could have just as easily been his group doing that. I wonder how many times he's had a similar dream. Yeah, what, what the horse said. 
俺の国じゃなかったの。温かくて、草原が波打って、どこまでも。Vinland is a, a real place, but also feels like just a part of himself, keeping hope alive that there's another way, that life could be better than this. And horn drinking! <laughs> is there any other, any better form of partying? If you haven't drunk alcohol out of a horn, have you really lived? I mean, Thorkel is literally holding down an entire army by himself right now, so. No horn? I'm disappointed. Like <laughs> they have this quota. The pillaging quota has, has been completed. I'm really glad for once to actually not know history. I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> I love how Thargo le legit is a whole force. Unto himself. It's so amazing. They all have so much respect for him. Which, you know, actually, it's consistent with what we've seen so far. I was thinking about this back back in the first episode. Like, just looking for a point of comparison for Thor's. We saw how great Thor's was, and we saw him fighting alongside Thorkel. So at that point, I thought it was just like a Viking thing. Though they might have all been Vikings. I don't I don't really know who was fighting in that, that battle. But no, it turns out that actually Thor's and Thorkel are just sort of in a league of their own. Which is in its way a tribute to Thor's ability that matches what I want to think about him. And also makes it more interesting to think that Thorfinn might come face to face with Thorkel at some point in, you know, more a more meaningful capacity. I don't know, I think Thorkel's crossed certain key lines that make him not care about that. They have this much spare energy, huh? They're this confident of their victory. The deepest thing you can call a man. The deepest, most dark insult. Scenes that you can feel. I feel like we see it in such a different light than he does. Oh wow. Oh wow, Aslan's showing up? Or is already there? Ooh, this is interesting. Might be a long time coming. <laughs> He's not really trying. Manipulation would involve some kind of deception. There's no deception here. It's just Asgard's recognizing exactly who Thorfinn is and what motivates him. As far as we've seen, Asgard is sort of like, you can leave anytime you want, but while you're here, why don't you take out this platoon of soldiers and I'll give you a duel. The reason he feels manipulated is because he's sort of playing himself. He doesn't understand what he's doing. He's playing kind of a weird survival game that's not totally self-honest or genuine. He's not the hero here, at least not yet, and this is not about justice. Asclad does not have clean hands by any stretch of the imagination, but one key difference seems to be that Asclad is not really deluded about it. He seems to have wrapped his head around the whole thing pretty much to an, to an extent that he's comfortable with and functional with, for better or for worse. <laughs> Right. If Asklad is smart, I think one way to totally get Thorfinn on his side is to align him with a larger, more satisfying goal. Everything comes to an end. Saxons are wiped out, but then one day they will be wiped out as well. <laughs> Judgment came early for this cattle thief. What are you getting at, Asclad? The dawn of a new age. The dawn of Ragnarok? Does this wait what? Oh, there's just so much, there's so much going on right now. I'm wondering if they're not gonna end up fighting side by side at this point. Not that they haven't already, but that was a really beautiful speech. I'm not exactly sure what to make of it yet, as far as it concerns Asclad and who he is. Actually, the first thing that comes to mind is Kimberly from Full Metal Alchemist with his whole, you know, I can't change the fate of the world and there's a new order coming, I just want to see it. Though I feel like for Asclad, this is probably just the the tip of the iceberg. This is the beginning of a full 
fuller philosophy. It does explain a lot about the way he conducts himself on a day-to-day -day basis, given the fact that he has such a broad perspective, you know? If he's thinking about eras and impermanence, though I would just take a guess that he's not reading this in what would maybe be a, a typical reading of it, which is that the significance of one's life sort of diminishes or gets smaller, the broader perspective you have. And instead is something which I think is maybe more interesting, which is that actually your life might actually get more significant the broader perspective you take. You know, because he's talking about all these epics and that's one way to frame it, you know, like this era ends and another one begins. But the truth is these are not real distinctions. They're just kind of labels that we put on them for conceptualization. The truth is that time and development and societies and whatever, the history of mankind is a lot more fluid and there is no one era without all the eras that came before it. There's no separating it. You know, there's sort of one path, there's one journey of, of mankind and probably, you know, much bigger of, of the world and, you know, the universe itself. So to exist at any part of that almost means you're an essential part of all of it, or at least all the things that come next in terms of your significance and, you know, the role you play. But then you also obviously have a connection to the past because you, you were here because of results of the past. So there's a beautiful state to be had. I don't know if it's, it's exactly what Aslan's getting at. It's just sort of what's coming to mind where if you really zoom out like that and and don't be so quick to feel terrible about it, there's a real beauty in recognizing vividly your point on the timeline, even if you realize it's small relative to other things. And it's questionable if it even is small, you know? Like if, if something exists as a whole, is it the same thing without any one of its parts? I mean, if you're talking about very specific things, then... Yeah, I mean, one's life probably makes no difference. Like, if I were to disappear from the planet tomorrow, not a lot would change in a, in a way anybody would notice, in the grand scheme of things. Yet, at the same time, even though the results of my life would be unseen and, you know, can't be traced specifically to anything good or bad, because we don't sort of know what it is and we don't really know what the outcome is or the trajectory is, I'll forever be a part of the history of the way things went down. And I think that thought gets way more interesting if you can find a way to believe that the universe is naturally benevolent, which is sort of a more difficult topic. If you believe that, you know, existence is a good thing, then your existence is a part of that goodness. And so, you know, what does it sort of matter? The daily grievances. It's a hard perspective to keep because we don't really live there. You know, we live in the day-to-day -day reality and there's lots of stress and there's, and there's always, you know, things to cope with. But I always like to see people even reaching for that, you know, even reaching that there's a little bit more than just the moment to moment and whatever situation one happens to find themselves in at any given time. Ask that, huh? He's an interesting guy. He just keeps getting more interesting as time goes on. England. Oh yeah, but these attackers. Yeah. This attacker? This lone... Uh, yeah. Horse man. Not an attacker. <laughs> Are we maybe gonna assist? <laughs> the London Bridge effort? <laughs> I'm ass glad I do what I want. <laughs> I mean, I think the answer to that is... Probably. <laughs> oh, wow! Wait, what? Kanu already lost? He got crushed off screen? Damn, that was a letdown. I thought he was like geared up to destroy. Instead, he got wiped out. We didn't, didn't even get to see it. It wasn't even worth seeing. Yes, with his large pencil. Okay, here it is. Here, here is us seeing it. <laughs> seeing the carnage and destruction. I like I'm eating my words right now. I was saying big of him or big headed of Thorkel to think he could turn the tides by himself. Yet here we are. Not two episodes later, seemingly turning the tides of battle by himself. Okay. I thought it was a London Bridge defense mission. Turns out, no, this is just a war of absolute aggression and destruction. Can you get out of the tent and <laughs> live up to the expectations I had for you as a silent character? Anywhere there is wood, there is Thorkel and danger. Anywhere there is a large object. And then G Jesus? <laughs> and then, yeah. That's a that's a big looming question. Oh. I don't know, maybe it was part of his plan, just to give him the maximum benefit of the doubt. He wanted to be captured, like Bane, or the Joker, or all the Batman movies, really. How much do we care about the prince, though? What has he done for us lately? You don't want to pass up a chance to see Thorical in action. Speaking of ages, Thorkel is an age unto himself. The sound of our era coming to a, coming to its completion? Ragnarok, yeah. What the? I guess we will not be helping the prince on this day. Maybe some other time. Oh no, not the horse. 
Solo effort? For what? Is this a ploy for... Huh, huh. I see, I see. Really hedging their bets there. This is a large grab. This could be it. The final score, the biggest one, the biggest heist. But I feel like this is, it's so easy and poetic for this to backfire. It's just, you grab it a little bit big here. His hands are not as big as Thorkel's, but he's grabbing it Thorkel-sized dreams. Anyway, Ragnar's coming. Who gives a crap? Doesn't matter. <laughs> I wonder what his men would think about this vision, though. Do you want to be led by someone who is convinced that everything is about to end anyway? I don't know. I would be mildly disconcerted. Thorfinn's about to see some stuff, too. <laughs> He's about to be involved in this. And peaceful ending. This was such a roller coaster. this episode. I was expecting Newt, Canute to have like this glorious episode. I thought it was going to be a, a canute centric episode, but... Now he's just kind of like in a tent for a lot of it, and then just kind of gets captured. Then also the unexpected meeting of, or conversation with Thorfinn and Asclad. Asclad revealing that he has some bleak <laughs> sort of points of view for the future, which makes his decision making questionable, but definitely epic if you're going against Thorkel, who himself has proven to be worth, you know, I don't know how many men, a thousand men? He, he just is an army. So very exciting and excellent setup for what I'm sure is going to be a really, really great super high stakes engagement where it feels like Asclad has finally maybe just gone a step too far just as Thorfinn is maybe coming around to him a little bit.